so we have an announcement. Uh, John Hutchinson is leaving uh, us uh, to go back to his native Australia. He's got a really good opportunity there um, uh, to join a first team staff. And, uh, you know, as you guys know, he was a, a pretty famous player in Australia for a long period of time with Central Coast Mariners. Uh, and, you know, John was uh, instrumental, fundamental to uh, changing the culture at S2. Uh, really, I thought, put us on a completely different path than we were on before. Uh, and I think did a whole bunch of heavy lifting and hard work that maybe wasn't evident yet last year and will be evident this year. Uh, but I think really set the table for some of the talent coming through. Um, got an opportunity he couldn't refuse. Uh, we are very sad to lose him uh, and, to, and we will miss him. And uh, for any of you guys who got to spend some time with him, you'll understand why. Cause he's just a fantastic guy uh, and he's going to have a ton of success going forward. Um, we are going to promote Chris Little. Uh, Chris obviously won the uh, national title and was the national coach of the year uh, and is very familiar with a lot of these homegrown players that we've signed to the USL team. So seems like a natural fit. Uh, Chris is uh, highly qualified, you know, has coach of the year background in, in college uh, and in youth soccer uh, as well as uh, his experience in the academy. So we're very excited to add him. Um, and this completes then our restructuring of the club uh, insofar as we're essentially removing S2 as an entity unto itself. And we now have two phases of the club. So we have Sounders as the first team and we have player development below that. Uh, player development will be run off the field by Mark Nichols, uh, which we announced uh, back November, December. Uh, I think the season ending press conference and then uh, Chris Little is going to run our on field uh, portion of development so the development now simply becomes u12 to usl it's all one progression up to that point and then we begin to transition players up to the first team so uh, this was something that we're very excited about doing i think it makes us more efficient um, and it gives these kids the clearest cleanest pathway uh, to go into the first team so we're excited to add chris sad to lose john um, uh, but it's a it's a Change is, ine is inevitable in this business, and um, hopefully we look forward and we're excited about uh, what the season holds at the USL level and, and not just the MLS level. What is it about Chris's, co Chris's coaching that makes him so effective? I think he uh, has a really definite plan in mind in terms of how he wants to play. Uh, you know, if you looked at the U17 team in particular last year, uh, they were able to play that style game in, game out. Um, and I think he's he's very good in terms of uh, his organization and his accountability. I think that uh, he sets expectations and he is very clear in his communication with the guys as to what uh, what is needed and what's required. And um, you know he goes from there. And, and uh, you know again yeah, he, he certainly benefited from having lots of good players on that team too. And and that's exactly the point is is hopefully with good good talent in the USL now. The, certainly the most talented roster we've ever had at that team by probably by a mile. Um, you know, with good coaching, who's familiar with those kids, hopefully gives those kids a little bit of a comfort zone. Uh, and I want us to, you know, to be contending for a playoff spot this year at the USL level. Chris remains the academy director of coaching. What does that role look like knowing he's also a full-time USL head coach? Uh, I don't think that changes a whole lot. Yes, he does retain that role, uh, it, but as director of coaching, he was already coaching all the other coaches. Hutch was the exception, and um, with Hutch moving on, Chris fills that role and you know winds up instructing everybody beneath him. So the idea is to have a common co coaching curriculum across the uh, organization as well as a common playing curriculum, and uh, we thought that that was really the right way to go and the best way, again, to, to have not just players but coaches in the pipeline to continue up. We're, we're really happy we've been able to promote from within with respect to this role, and it allows us to not have, hopefully, a traumatic transition when it comes to any of these roles. With uh, Chris, he's almost echoing what Tab Ramos did, where there's somewhat of a golden generation who's following them as they age up. Is that part of why the decision was to go with Chris, is because the, the S2 roster right now has nine guys that played under him? Certainly that's a factor. We, we believe that with these kids, 17, 18 years old, some of them younger than that, um, that the more continuity we can give them, the more stability we can give them, the more familiarity we can give them, the better off they're going to be or the more likely their success off the field, which hopefully leads to success on the field. Um, the one thing that I'd maybe push back on a little bit, Dave, is, uh, you know, we hope this isn't a golden generation, you know, meaning we want this to be sustainable and replicable. That's the whole point. We don't want this to be lightning in a bottle. Uh, DeAndre Yedlin lands, then Jordan Morris lands, and once every four or five years we get a kid and he's good. The whole point of this is to systemically produce players. Sure, it'll come up and down, and there'll be groups with some and groups with none, but look, these kids, they won a national title. They look good. I don't know if there's going to be two pros out of that group or ten. 
you know, we'll see. Um, but the next step for us is to see which kids fight and which kids earn it. And as we said yesterday, we're going to take, I think, literally 10 to preseason. Um, and we have some roster spots available if somebody earns those. Uh, and we'll see how they do. And But I don't want to assume that this is a golden generation. And I also don't want to assume that we can't do this again at U12, U15, and uh, continue to reproduce this time and time again. You also said that the target is the playoffs this year at the USL level. Um, what gives you that confidence that this team can make those steps forward? You know, I think that we have uh, we have continuity. And again, I know when we're changing coaches, that sounds funny. But we actually have more players back than we ever have before. Um, and we've expanded the roster. So we've expanded. I think we've signed, I can't remember now, 14, 15 guys. But we have the ability to sign up to 16 now in that team. Historically, we've signed closer to 10 or 11. So it's given us more depth, more stability. And so Hutch, and this is what I mean when I said he changed the culture. He was instrumental in having us kind of rethink how we looked at S2 because the way we had done it, we had tried to be very efficient about it, um, but it kind of became neither this nor that. It kind of got stuck in between. And so one of the things that he identified for us, uh, along with Wade Weber, who will remain as the assistant on that team, is a big part of, of what we have going forward as part of that continuity, um, is they said, look, we need a bigger training squad. You know, So when we get that call from the first team and they need three guys to come up, we're not stuck with six guys playing small-sided games. Uh, and that will allow us to address some of the tactical uh, identity issues where we're together often enough, we play uh, often enough together that we can be a little bit more co coherent in terms of style of play. So um, those are the things we're pushing. Um, so to be clear, we've increased our investment a little bit. We've increased the number of players on that team. We're excited about guys like Trey Muse potentially coming down and, and joining that team from the first team. Um, and I think uh, it's it's a big part of who we're going to be going forward. So we need to make it work, and we're going to throw everything out we can at it um, to try to give these guys a stable training environment and really invest more in them to give them a, the best possible chance we can to come up and succeed. Uh, given the talent you have uh, with uh, S2, do you feel the need to bring in someone like David Estrada, who was kind of a player coach, filled a little bit of a hole where you may have been lacking. Um, is that something you're looking at, or are you satisfied with what uh, talent you have uh, for S2? It's, it's a, look, we're always looking, right? They haven't even opened preseason yet, so we're always trying to get better. The David Estrada thing, is, it's a great point. First of all, because David was phenomenal. Right? He was absolutely incredible in terms of on the field, off the field, that mentorship that he brought. Um, and I would have loved to have retained him. You know, he has some, some family and personal reasons to, to go elsewhere. Um, so would we like to replicate that? Sure. Talent-wise, do I think we're better? I do. So if you're talking about Alfonso Campo Chavez, who's arguably the best forward on the U-17 national team, and Diaz, who's averaged more than a goal a game over the last two years in, in the U-19 level, those are two guys we're really excited about and I think are, are on paper better talents than David Estrada. Now, was David Estrada at 28 years old or whatever he was last year ahead of those guys on day one? Probably. But that's exactly the hope and aspiration. That's the point, right, is we're going to put more talented, younger guys in that environment, hope that they succeed, and hope we then replicate that same formula on the first team. Younger, more talented guys, more upside, better potential for the future. You have a bunch of guys who've been getting youth national team call-ups last year and this year. Uh, isn't it all strange to ponder the fact that at the USL level, you might wind up having some guys missing for the U20 World Cup? It'd be cool, right? You want to talk about high-class problems, right? We, we have I mean, we have 20 kids in youth national teams. I mean, that, that's and, and again, it's a nice number to talk about, and that's gaps in between. What matters the most are obviously the 17s and the 20s. But, you know, we have kids in both of those pools now uh, going forward. I mean, if you talk about Sam Rogers and Trey Muse for the 20s, um, that'll be a big high-profile event. Uh, the 17 World Cup will be a big high-profile event. And so uh, we want our kids in national teams. We want them in those showcases. And, look, we're going to align our USL uh, experience to try to support them and put them in the best position to succeed in those tournaments. Because, look, we, we got to put the Sounders on the map. You know, we, we, we're on the map from a first-team perspective. We're not on the map from a, from a player transaction perspective. And if we want to develop players, we have to participate in the global marketplace, uh, and we have to have people uh, who think our players have value. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're going to continue to push for and strive for. And, uh, you know, hopefully these kids are coming up to the first team, and that's a linear path, and that's really easy and predictable. But if it's not, we still need to make something of this investment, and that's something we're going to work really hard at. The U-20 World Cup is traditionally one of those events where major clubs come in and swoop players out from under their current yep. organization. Is that a, a problem that you'd like to, to have to be challenged with an offer coming in? Absolutely. No, and, and, and again, like, I think people are like, oh, that's, you know, it's different, right? And, well, that's a threat a foreign club could take. But if the foreign club comes in and they make a substantial investment in our player and we say, hey, we have this alternative that is X percent of what we had before and now, you know, and the sum total of these two things is better, 
then we're better off. And you're going to do that deal and you're going to take it. And it's not only is it not a threat, but it's an opportunity. Because honestly, the first guy we sell will be at this, but then the second guy we sell will be this, and then the third guy we sell will be that. And again, I want to be clear too. We're not going out this saying we got to sell guys. Like we're just going to throw ourselves open and everybody come raid the cabinet and all that stuff. It's just of the 10 or 11 guys we have signed, you're not, they're not all going to make it up to the Sounders. That's, that's a, just a, it's very unlikely. And so I do want us to be open uh, to these types of outcomes uh, across 17s, across 20s, uh, across every phase of our development because it's, it's about being efficient with how we develop players. And it's about giving these kids opportunity too. I mean, if a kid comes up and he's behind Nico Ladero, you know, he may not make it up right away. And we might be better off loaning them out and giving them some games and some experience. And that's part of what we, when we meet with these kids, we sign them at 16, 17 years old, I'm, we're meeting with their parents. And we're saying, we're responsible for the well-being of your child and to give them an opportunity. And again, that doesn't have to be a linear two years from now starting for the Sounders opportunity. It can be anywhere in the world. And that's where, you know, the mindset change comes in a little bit. And where we, we if we give these kids opportunities, we'll recruit better kids in uh, and we'll continue the cycle in a virtuous way. Trey Muse, what can you tell us about him and what made him such a high pedigreed prospect and why you guys thought it was important to bring him in? Um, MLS has a roster rule that allows you to take a goalkeeper under the age of 24 and you get an extra roster spot for that. So uh, that helped. Uh, but look, we thought Trey was the best goalkeeper in college and you know, sometimes there's not a lot of complex analysis. All right, so I get the best goalkeeper in college for free. Okay, let's do that. Um, Chris kind of led the revamp of the academy's like game model, training curriculum, uh, positional profiles. Do you see those things he instituted translating to USL? Yeah, I do. I do. And I think having uh, familiarity with the players helps. Uh, but that's certainly a big part of then, that's as the director of coaching, where we want that across all levels of our player development. Uh, and that's something where, again, when these guys come up, then hopefully our first team coaches are in a mode where they know what they're getting, right? They see the kids, uh, certainly for a month uh, at the beginning of preseason, they see them regularly during the season and now when we bring the kid up now it's plug and play it's not you have to reinvent the wheel or you have to recreate a position it's i know what i have to do in this role i play this way at this time and now the whole system functions at a higher level two quick first team questions uh jordy delem is out of country social media says france is that national team duty it him? is not he's uh got visa issues uh, but we expect him to be back uh good stuff i think he might be back as soon as tomorrow uh, but we expect him back this week. New who and Jordy, I think, are more likely next week. Uh, but we'll get all that stuff cleaned up as we talked uh, yesterday. And sometimes those appointments take time to schedule, et cetera. And we'll get him back in. We should don't expect any issues. New who's still the visa issue as well. Then. He literally has his appointment tomorrow. Okay. So. Are you being affected at all by the shutdown with some of this stuff? I can't say that I have. I mean, spiritually, I guess, in well, terms and, of and the... As, as a my, team, though, with some of the, some of the guys who are having visa issues. I... Yes, big picture as a practical matter, we, we haven't had, I can't claim that that's it. I mean, these, these are things that are, yeah, they're scheduled way ahead of time. And, and it is, it is. I mean, for some perspective, there's a huge backlog before the shutdown. So, you know, so I guess in that sense, yes, but I would argue that there's a broader immigration issue that probably merits some national political discussion at some point. But uh, we'll leave that for today.